After Renee gave birth, she saw that her son had dark skin and she immediately rejected him. Three years passed and an incredibly shocking thing happened. Renee stared in shock at the baby in the nurse's arms. She rubbed her eyes to make sure she was seeing clearly. The nurse extended her arms to Renee, inviting her to hold her baby, swaddled in a thick blanket. Renee shrieked and jumped away from the baby, pointing accusingly at the precious bundle in the nurse's arms, she shouted, Tell me it's a cruel joke you're playing on me. Please tell me that this isn't real. I'm a white woman, I should give birth to white babies, not hideous dark-skinned ones. Disgusted by what Renee said, the nurse cuddled the baby close to her chest. She was no longer eager to give the baby to Renee if she was going to continue insulting him. Renee told the nurse that she didn't want the baby. The nurse was shocked. She demanded to know what Renee meant and if she was being serious. Renee acknowledged that she had all her wits about her and was making this decision coherently. She didn't want to raise a black son because it wouldn't look good for her. But what about your partner? Is he in agreement? The nurse, whose name was Ally, asked. Renee waved it aside. She haughtily asked if Ally saw anyone in the hospital besides her. Renee had come to the hospital alone to give birth to her child. She had checked in days early, hoping to have a quick delivery. The staff at the hospital, including Ally, had assumed that she was eager to meet her baby. They had expected that her significant other would show up soon, but he never did. Renee had never even mentioned him until that moment. Ally informed the management of the hospital of Renee's request. Different doctors examined her to make sure she was in sound health of body and mind. They wanted to rule out postpartum blues as the reason why Renee was acting up. It something happened that new mothers would act similarly to Renee, denying their babies and refusing to touch them. But a few days later, after they'd have time to rest, refresh and be themselves again, they would beg to see their babies and lavish love on them. However, that was not the case with Renee. When the examinations were done, the management brought documents over to her. Renee didn't hesitate to write a refusal that signed over her baby to the hospital to do as they liked. The staff watched Renee with mixed emotions. On one hand, she seemed like a mother who was struggling with personal issues and didn't feel equipped to raise a baby. On the other hand, she seemed like a selfish, callous, and hateful woman who was rejecting her baby because he was an inconvenience to her. Renee's features were arranged carefully to look distraught, but the staff refused to feel sorry for her because she hadn't even tried to look at her baby or hold him once. It was clear that Renee wanted absolutely nothing to do with her son, and that made the poor baby so pitiable. She turned her back on him so solemnly that she didn't even make any effort to give him a name. She had branded him a John Doe mercilessly. 48 hours after she gave birth, Renee was discharged from the hospital, and she left breezily as if she popped by for a simple, quick visit. With the baby in their care, the hospital considered various options for him. They decided that he would be better off at a baby home for the time being. Then they could match him with adoptive parents later on. Satisfied with their plan, they started preparing the necessary documents for him. It was in this process that they came up with a name for the baby, Mark. Eli was one of the nurses in charge of taking care of the baby. On the third day after he was born, Eli came to wash him up, feed him, and look after him. She came hours earlier than she was supposed to because she wanted to check in on him and see how he was faring. She felt sorry for the poor baby and wanted to shower him with love with the limited time they had together. However, she noticed something odd about his pallor. Something was wrong with Mark. On closer look, she gasped. Baby Mark was struggling to breathe and was turning blue. If she hadn't been early, he might have died. Eli called the attention of the other medics and the baby was rushed to the neonatal intensive care unit. He was hurriedly placed on oxygen and monitored closely. Eli hoped that in a few hours, baby Mark would be fine. But as the situation turned out, the doctors discovered more complications and he remained in the ICU for several days fighting for his life. This had been a boy who was perfectly healthy at birth. How did he get to this point? Eli was so shocked and worried. Ally's concern for baby Mark was so great that she hardly left his side. She watched over him silently and continuously. She checked on him at least once every hour and constantly ensured he was comfortably napping. He looked vulnerable and so small hooked to different wires, tubes and monitors. Thankfully, the oxygen had been removed after a few hours and he was breathing by himself. 
What had caused the blockade of oxygen was a tiny clump of milk that Mark didn't swallow properly. It had gotten stuck in his windpipe and hindered oxygen flow, but medications had been administered that broke up the clump and that was no longer a problem. But there were grave consequences that could result from such an accident because Mark was just a baby. It was why he remained in the ICU. His strength was gone. He slept so much that Eli frequently checked the monitor and the slight rise and fall on his chest to assure herself that he was alive. She refused to go home after her shifts, afraid that something might happen to Mark in her absence. She could hardly sleep as well, choosing to keep a vigil praying for Mark. Several times a day, she stood next to him and encouraged him to win his fight. He had to overcome because there was so much he could be. The other hospital staff was concerned for Eli's health. They felt that if she kept this attitude up, she wouldn't be able to look after her other patients, might faint from exhaustion, or God forbid, if anything happened to Mark, she would take a hard blow. The nurses came up with a way to get her to rest. One of them swapped places with her, remaining at Mark's side while she slept at the nurses' quarters, for a few hours at most before jolting awake to check on Mark. Some days later, the doctors gathered the hospital staff who were responsible for Mark's care. Eli was in attendance and standing up front like a protective mother hen. The doctors kept avoiding meeting her gaze as they shared the purpose of the gathering, but it was nearly impossible to do because her eyes were fixed steadfastly on them and she was standing in front. The doctors announced that the chances of Mark being severely disabled was 50-50. This was as a result of being without oxygen for some time. They suspected he might already have the condition known as athetoid cerebral palsy. It would cause his legs to be stiff and uncoordinated, his body to move without his control, whenever he was either too excited or upset, cause him to stumble and his body to rock like a boat over rough water. That wasn't the end. They also expected Mark to have cognitive impairment. One of the nurses asked how mentally retarded he would be. Eli's vision became blurry as tears filled her eyes. She was afraid to hear what the doctor's answer would be, but forced herself to remain standing. It took all of her will. She kept her face down to hide her raging emotions. There is truly no way to tell the extent of his mental retardness until he grows older. He will probably be behind in comprehension and logic when compared to other kids his age. The doctor sounded sorry and helpless. Eli closed her eyes and tears ran down her cheeks. She didn't bother wiping them off. Her heart felt like a dead weight in her chest. She was so angry that Mark was facing such an unfair situation. First of all, a disability of this ramification drastically lowered his chances of getting adopted, because no one wanted to bear that burden. Secondly, she was angry at Renee. If only Renee had been a little compassionate, if she had held her baby, loved him and chosen to feed him for a few days before handing him over to be adopted, things might have been different. She forced herself to square her shoulders and face the present reality. She couldn't afford to go off on a tangent of what-ifs. What's done is done. The only thing left was to find the solution. Eli went home that day. Her husband Ed was so happy to see her. He worked as a security agent and had been taking night shifts because staying home without her had felt so lonely. He inquired about the baby she had been looking after at the hospital. When Eli heard Ed's question, she burst into tears. He was surprised. He started consoling her, asking how he could make things better. Eli wanted to tell him that there was nothing he could do about the situation, but an idea struck her. They had been married for four years and didn't have children yet. It wasn't because they didn't want children. In fact, they had tried numerous times and were disappointed when their efforts failed. It had almost driven a wedge in between them and made them miserable. They didn't want that so they decided to stop trying and enjoy their life together. What if we adopt baby Mark? Eli asked Ed, her voice filled with hope. Ed was taken aback. Was she serious? Adoption was an idea they were toying with, but hadn't actually taken seriously because they were holding out faint hope that they would conceive eventually. Ed refused. He didn't want them to adopt a baby, especially not one that would not have the same skin color as them, and that was possibly disabled. It would be too difficult. Ed knew his wife was attached to the baby, but he was convinced that she would get over it. He blamed the circumstances for messing with his wife's emotions. Eli insisted that adopting Mark wasn't an emotional decision for her. The baby needed them. Ed asked her to get some rest. He said that they would talk when she was feeling better. 
Eli knew he was patronizing her, but she was too exhausted to dwell on it. Two weeks later, Eli unexpectedly found herself working three shifts concurrently because her colleagues were down with the flu. She was unprepared for this and hadn't packed an overnight bag from her house. She called her husband, Ed, and sweetly pleaded with him to bring some necessities over for her. He agreed and came. He surprised her by also bringing homemade food he had prepared for her. She was thrilled. Ed spent some time at the hospital. He talked with his wife and went with her for a few rounds. The last one was to see baby Mark. Mark was doing so much better. The wires, tubes, and monitors had been removed, and he looked fine. He also seemed playful and kept waving his chubby arms around whenever he was awake. Eli loved seeing this. Ed drew close and admired the little boy. Mark tugged at his heart, and he didn't know why. The baby gurgled with delight when Ed leaned close and made funny faces. Ed reached out a hand to touch him, but before he could, Mark wrapped his tiny baby fist around Ed's thumb. His heart turned to mush at this gesture. He got teary eyes as he felt an inexplicable connection to Mark. Although he knew the full risks behind adopting Mark, including his possible disability, Ed looked at his wife and agreed to become the baby's dad. Adopting Mark was relatively easy. As the months flew by, he grew big, strong and was developing normally. There was no sign of a disability. In fact, he was turning out to be a genius. The doctors confirmed that he was in perfect health. The family celebrated this miracle. On Mark's first birthday party, Eli wasn't feeling too well. It turned out that she was expecting. The family was shocked and so excited. They were so happy at their change of luck. She gave birth to the baby and he was healthy. Mark had a baby brother and the two were close. As a toddler, Mark was sharp. At a random kiddies event that Eli took him to, he attracted the attention of a huge toy company who wanted him to become their child model. He fit what they were looking for. Eli agreed to do it because she thought it would be fun. She didn't expect much from it. However, it turned out to be a massive success. The toy company sold out products that Mark advertised. A casting director even approached Eli and Ed to request that Mark play a minor role in a movie. Mark was only two years old. His parents agreed. When the movie came out a few days after his third birthday, Mark became a sensation. He had somehow captured the hearts of viewers and the public wanted more of him. He got many offers to be on shows and adverts. So much money was coming into his parents' hands because of him. They set up a trust fund for him and still had more than enough left over to care for him on a daily basis. By this time, Mark had caught the attention of the general public. He was invited to come on national TV with his mom, Eli. People wanted to know how she was raising such a remarkable child. That question led Eli to tell the story of how Mark's birth mother abandoned him because of his skin color and how she came to adopt him. Renee watched this interview. She gasped in terror when she recognized Eli as one of the nurses from the hospital. Seeing how adorable Mark looked and the success he's achieved at such a tender age, she was full of regrets. She had abandoned him because he was the child of her ex-boyfriend. She was with a new boyfriend who didn't want children, especially not a black one. Even then, her white boyfriend treated her badly and she was miserable. She wished she had kept her son and that's all she'd have to hold on to for the years to come. Regrets. What a touching story. What do you think about Rene rejecting her son? Does she deserve to meet him and have a relationship with him? Let us know in the comments. Thank you for watching.